Okay, welcome back everybody. Hope you guys got to enjoy the break. Uh, I had a bunch of questions come up over the break, so I figured I'd start this by maybe answering a couple of them really quickly. Uh, one of the questions came up is, this is just an interesting one to me, so I'll, I'll lead with it. What happens when, you know, there's devices sans screens, or will you have one device and a screen that you interact with? And uh, I just got some illustrations of some of these trends that I think maybe are worth uh, looking at for half a second. So it's currently true, where is my image of this? Oh, oh, one second, I may have shoved this into a different, and at this point I have to apologize, I am jumping between like 20 decks. So if I get slow as I do that, Forgive me. Uh, oh. Ah, here we go. Found it. So I took this screenshot of my phone and like, here's all the things I can currently control using my smartphone as the computer, right? And many of these things, sometimes they have a display, sometimes they don't have a display, but you got things like your lights, your stereo, uh, the things connected to your TV, your scales, your camera, your drone, which of course everybody needs a drone, right? Little beacons, home security, game consoles, all kinds of stuff. So the smartphone in many ways has also started to become essentially kind of a remote control in some ways. So this is something to keep on top of, which is how many pocket supercomputers do you actually need? Maybe you actually only need one and it can act as the control for a lot of things. And you'll note uh, a number of wearables actually show up in this list as well in terms of being controlled by the smartphone. Then we also have uh, similar things going on, which I think are related. And Amazon has a couple of really crazy devices. Actually, this is not the best image of all those crazy Amazon devices. I got one more here. Here we go. Like, hardware is so cheap these days that companies like Amazon are just making things that are essentially buy buttons, right? I have one of these Echoes in my house and you can speak to it and you can say, Amazon, buy toilet paper, and they buy toilet paper. There's these little uh, things that connect to Wi-Fi in your home, these Amazon Dash buttons, and they're literally branded with a product and you just push that product and it orders it online. Uh, there's the dash, which is like a little keychain ring that again, you can speak to it. So you can just do all of your shopping. You can shop from your phone, your tablet, your TV. Right? Like they're literally just making physical buy buttons and putting them everywhere in your home. So that's an interesting thing to consider in that context too. And why I last slide on this topic is these things are just becoming so super tiny. Right, that is the entire computer inside of the Apple Watch. That is a full Chrome box. It just plugs right into any display that you want. It's what you can go out there and view in a Chrome box or a Chromebook, that's the entire product. Here's that Amazon Dash thing that I showed a second ago. And an illustration of where's the gap here. Right? Computers we can make super, super tiny these days, but displays are still, an issue, and the biggest issue is battery life. This is the new MacBook Pro. That is the actual computer in it, and everything else, basically, <laughs> around it is a battery. So a computer can get super tiny and show up in all kinds of different places, but powering that computer is not necessarily a um, solved problem yet. So I just thought that was some interesting stuff to show. There was also a question around native apps versus mobile apps, so we could talk a little bit about um, those kinds of things. Uh, the way I like to think about native versus web isn't necessarily as a versus kind of scenario, right? A lot of people will make this conversation native versus mobile web. Who will win, right? Like, fight! <sighs> but if you actually employ both, it turns out you get much more bang for your buck, and much better strategy. Because when you look across the ecosystem of devices, and just to look at the ones we talked about earlier, right? Smartphone, tablet, laptop, desktop. I won't draw the wearables and the um, uh, TVs on here yet. But 
you've got different operating systems, potentially each of these devices comes across multiple operating systems, and it's not uncommon for a consumer to, at work, have a Windows desktop, maybe they got a Windows laptop, maybe they bought a cheap Android tablet, maybe they use an uh, iPhone as their smartphone, so they could have multiple of these form factors and multiple of these OSs. So one of your ways to reach them is to build a native app for everything. Have fun. Uh, another way to reach them everywhere is on web browsers. And the other more interesting thing to me about the web browser is that it actually acts as a connection between all these things. Right? So if I have a URL that I share from a native app on my tablet and then I pick it up later on my desktop, the web can route these things between these different devices and make these connections. So one of the ways to think about links and um, the connections between all the stuff is through the web. That's one area where web can play a role in your strategy. But then the other area where the web can play a role in your strategy is um, thinking about it in these terms. Let me actually switch to this slide for half a second. So my, my like two cent answer to native versus web is native is really good at richness. Deep, fast, uh, immersive experiences, maybe for your power users and the like. Whereas the web is really about reach. Because every single one of these OSs and every single one of these devices has a web browser, has a way of dealing with URLs and content. Whether they come from a messaging app, whether they come from Facebook, whether they come from um, email, you name it. They've all got a web browser to deal with it. And so this is just a, a snapshot of some uh, early data of the product that we built uh, last year or so that uh, Google bought from us. The native app, as you can see, tons of action, right? Lots of activity. The people that are in the app are just doing tons of stuff, huge volumes. On the web, not doing as much. But the opposite story is true on the reach front, which is the amount of people we're growing in the app is kind of baby stepping, but the amount of people we can reach on the web is huge. So when you think strategically, right, you generally want both of these things. You want to be able to reach a wide set of people, and you want to have a rich experience. Maybe that's just for a subset of people, like power users. Maybe it's for a subset of features or things like this. But these two things can actually work really, really well to each other. And uh, this is an older slide, but I always like the point it made. This, this data has actually gotten more stark. Average number of apps used per month is about 26. The average number of apps used per week on a regular basis is about seven. On uh, Flurry's latest data, the most used app people use on their phone is actually 42% of the app time they spend on their phone. So if you can become the most used app on someone's phone, woohoo, you win. If you can be in that seven apps used weekly, woohoo, you win. Everything else is like, Ooh. And uh, there was recently a, a new study released that shows the average person downloads zero apps per month. But I don't know if I necessarily buy that one. But it is true that we are getting a saturation of these things. And less and less are people reaching out to more experiences. In contrast, through these apps that they use all the time, people hit an average of 24 different websites per day. So from a discovery perspective, again, this tells the same story. This is about reach, right? This is about richness. And it's hard to see how you would have a strategy without those two things interwoven with each other, right? So that's how I try to think about these two things together. Again, 26 apps per month, 24 websites per day. And now, with the, the average number of apps uh, downloaded per month, depending on where you look, is somewhere between two and zero per month. Right, so that's how many new things people will actually place on their phone in any given month versus 24 websites a day. It's a pretty big difference in terms of discovery. That said, though, you know, the richness and the quantity of interactivity you get from those web actions will be a lot lower, but you'll reach a lot more people as a result of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so with all that said, maybe what I will do is actually just open it up for questions. We got about 40 minutes here. So what do you guys want to talk about other than that? Yes.
I will throw you the Android. I've been given explicit instructions on how to interact with this. You must hug it and talk into this ear. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Do not talk into its butt. <laughs> Do not put it in your face like that. Was there any other instruction? Did I get all the instructions right? OK, they should put like a little instruction manual on the bottom here. All right, here you go. Hug it and talk into the ear, please. Hi, Luke. Um, Hi. Thank you. A great presentation earlier. Um, one small question. Uh, I've seen a lot of really poor implementations of inline field labels, you know, where you've got the field label inside the entry box in the form. Can you tell me any scenarios in which that actually works? You know, because I've seen very, very few. Sure. So uh, labels inside of fields in forms. Uh, wasn't a setup, I swear. I just have, <laughs> I literally just have slides galore. I've got about five decks open right now, so. OK, did I mention I'll beatbox later? So uh, why is it tempting to put labels inside of input fields? Well, because you can take a form that looks like this and essentially make it look like yay, right? So that's kind of cool. It looks simpler, less stuff inside the field to actually fill in and the like. Um, there are a couple challenges with this, though. And uh, if you go and actually start to interact with this stuff, if you use sort of like native controls, the moment you start interacting with that input field, the label goes away. So you don't know what you're putting in anymore. And afterwards, when you're trying to check all the stuff that you've put in, you don't know what labels you actually entered in there. For a short form, like something like username and password, maybe this isn't such a big deal because you can sort of infer what's happening. But for larger fields, it might be an issue as well. Another reason sometimes labels and input fields are confusing is because people mistake the label for an actually completed value. I mean, can you tell the difference between which of these is filled in and which one's not? Right? They're just like a little difference in the shade of gray. And so people will look at the form, see something inside it, and skip the field. Uh, increasingly, you can use some techniques where you explicitly code it so that that label stays until you start typing. But at that point, you still have that same issue. And the default behavior as of iOS 5 has sort of updated on this. On the web, though, a lot of people use scripts for labels inside of inputs. So what you'll find is somebody puts a label inside the input, like write a personal note to the recipient you have requested on LinkedIn, and I get invites that say, write a personal note to the recipients you have selected. I, Thank you, Eckert. It's really nice to know you care. It's like, don't even bother reading the text, right? Uh, Caroline Jarrett has done uh, a lot of usability on this stuff, and she went and tested a uh, form where it was a form for people that were in a job program, and there was a field where there was a job title, and you had to put in there like your sequence in the job program, like junior, senior, partner, you know what I mean? And uh, they had this label that said, my sequence. So they went and looked at 24 hours, 17,000 submissions. What percent of those submissions do you think had the title of my sequence for their job? Just throw out a number. What percent used 50? 85, 70, 70. 93, 93 ones, going ones, going ones for 93. Anybody want to top 93? Want to go higher? Nobody wants to beat 93? 97, 97 going once, 97 going twice, 97 going three times. Anybody want to beat 97? 99, that is correct. 99 had a title of my sequence. That means 1% of people interpret this as help text. Uh, so as Caroline puts out, if you include help text inside your forms, chances, quite likely many people will interpret it as a default. Now, there's ways to manage this. But in general, if you're using labels inside of input fields, you should be concerned about these things. You want to make sure they never become part of someone's answer. You want to make sure they're not confused with an actual answer. And be n note that they're absent when somebody finishes answering a form or all that. So there's some ways to get around this stuff. You can group things by putting something like billing address at the top, and then people can understand the structure below it and the like. But you just want to watch out, right? Um, so that, those are kind of the concerns with labels within input fields. However, I have actually seen 
a number of people implement these more and more and have some success with it. So very recently I got sent a um, note from the folks over at Staples and uh, they were very proud to tell me that they won best of class e-commerce checkout at eTail, uh, which is kind of cool. So what they did is they went from uh, a 22 field form down to a five field form. And I wish I could tell you what percent increase this gave them, but uh, they sent me the data, it was not on their decks. So I feel like I shouldn't actually say, but it was good. This good thing happened, conversion go up. And uh, the way they did it, they used a couple interesting techniques. Now you'll note that they went from um, labels inside of fields to labels inside of fields, but it wasn't, so it wasn't that much of an issue for them. But like, they did a whole bunch of stuff with inline validation, which may be a way to address some of these concerns. All right, so the label goes away, you don't know what you're filling in. Uh, they do this stuff where you collect name. And by the way, this is complete just guest checkout with five input fields. So you do address, and with address, they have this inline validation thing where they'll auto-complete the address for you. And through this, right, the fact that the label's gone maybe is not that big a deal because it's directly visible there. Uh, then you get phone number, email address, they do the same thing. So they do auto-complete on email address. As soon as you get to the A, you start completing that here. Uh, with credit card, they're using a credit card input mask pattern. They actually even have the scan credit card thing that iOS has by default built in. They also use smart defaults. Uh, so the, use the address that you put in here, they dynamically show the address that you entered and it's default check to use it as the billing address and they got a clear call to action here. So all these things together are actually a pretty big deal, but maybe through some of this inline validation stuff you can get away with labels within input fields. But as I say, just be mindful of those concerns that I raised at the beginning. Cool? All right, let's pass the Android on to uh, someone else. Anybody else want the Android next? No other questions? Should I just show random stuff that I think is cool? Okay, one down here, incoming. Remember, into the ear, please. Where do you think Pinch and Zoom fits with smartphone design as we go forward? Where does pinch and zoom fit with smartphone design? Uh, you see a lot of people sort of using that gesture on images and map kind of interfaces, but as with all gestures, maybe we should talk about gestures for half a second. Uh, let's see here. As with all gestures, gestures are invisible by default, right? So you have uh, these concerns about how to communicate gestures to people. And then the broader thing, about gestures that I think is worth pointing out is gestures tend to be pretty sloppy. Right? People aren't very precise when they've essentially got a thumb on the screen. So one of the things you need to do to account for that is to have large enough touch target sizes and the like. But other things to try and uh, manage is to not ask too much of gestures. Don't get too complicated with them and overthink them. So I'll show you kind of a couple things with that. So one, this sort of scroll, scroll, scroll action that I showed in my stalking video of the woman on the airplane, very, very common for making URA through information and pages. Before you used to have this scroll bar to do that. Now you can just sort of swipe at the screen to move things up and swipe at the screen to move things down. It is tempting to do things like try and associate different actions with multiple fingers, right? But in the case of something like this, you're actually better off if somebody has two fingers on the screen just to do the same kind of scrolling action that you would do with one hand on the screen. And the reason for this is people will often accidentally be touching the screen with more than one finger. So if that one scrolling gesture with one finger moves things up and down and then two fingers like moves you into edit mode, you're going to piss a lot of people off. Right, because they're going to accidentally have another finger touching on the screen or like, and you won't be able to uh, determine it with precision. So you shouldn't drastically change interactions based on the number of fingers on the screen. So that's kind of one thing. Another thing is, I don't know if you guys have seen this tendency to do horizontal and vertical scrolling. There's a couple of challenges with this when you do left and right thing. A, a lot of times people will make mistakes and inadvertently enter horizontal scrolling as they're trying to scroll vertically. 
we see this be a real big hiccup point for people a lot. And then B, a lot of times the horizontal scrolling gesture is not necessarily even expected. You can go really wrong with this. This was uh, the Yahoo Newsstand app. And in the Yahoo Newsstand app, they had all these crazy scrolling directions where you could go left or you could go down. And in some cases you go up. And in fact, then they had to go and make like these kind of things. Let's say the top area, you can scroll this way, the bottom area. And as soon as you enter this kind of world, just like pause and decide whether or not you're actually creating the right kind of interface. I have a, a great example of this, which I'll actually show. Um, related to this, sometimes you don't need a lot of data to determine that a UI isn't working. You just sort of need to, so here, here's a great example. I love this one. This is the new Time Inc. redesign. And they uh, decided to put all of their navigation behind this hamburger icon over here. And then they had to write the word menu underneath it. And then they put up this thing. New navigation, new time. Click on the menu to view your favorite sections. OK? OK. <laughs> and like you, I wasn't part of this, but you know the conversation here. Oh, crap, nobody's going to these pages anymore. Let's put the word menu on it. Oh, crap, nobody's reading the word menu. Let's put a giant call out telling people this is where we hid their stuff. And so when you see things like this, whether you see it on the gesture controls or whether you see them in uh, UI elements like this, you can kind of tell that there's some sort of usability thing going on. And as just a very small detour, I think this is hilarious, so I'll just show it real quick, and then I'll come back to answering your question, I promise. But you have to indulge me just for a moment, because this makes me laugh. Oh, where did I put that, dear Lord? Sorry, as I said, lots of scrolling through stuff. Ah, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Did you know that there's also a kebab menu? <laughs> that was the best thing you can do for your uh, mobile application. I call it the mystery meat of mobile nav, hamburger and kebab. What's behind each one? You just don't know until you try it. Somebody also pointed out to me that the three dots on the side is the meatball menu. So that's kind of one you can go with, too. But I like hamburger and kebab. It's just pretty good. OK, uh, what was I talking about? Gestures. Sorry, let's go back to the gesture thing for half a second. So we were talking about how um, many times gestures are sloppy. You want to support more than a single finger. As people move through these interfaces, having too much complexity with up, down, left, and right swiping tends to get um, complicated for people as well. And uh, I illustrated earlier, I tend to show this Stevens research a lot around how we're dealing kind of with one thumb. But there's actually a lot you can do to design for this reality when you think about it in terms of gestures, right? Remember this whole 75% is essentially a thumb on the screen. So uh, here's an example of doing a lot of stuff designing for this reality of one hand, one thumb. Uh, we had this app. Polar, where you can tap on the sides right in that comfortable to tap zone to give your opinion on stuff. So you can really quickly in a lightweight way, you can just drag up really lightly with that single thumb to scroll. And then again, chime in on these things. And then you can, uh, as you pull up from the bottom, we actually bring up tips so you can learn stuff as you go. You've done a couple things, now you're ready to move on to the next thing. So now the thing you learned is that you can swipe across. Again, another gesture really tied to the position of the finger that you learned about in the topic. You can pull down, and you'll note how the menu appears. So the menu sort of shows up right there as you drag down. If you uh, continue dragging, you can get refresh and see that bear hanging by his underwear at the top. Right? So this kind of pull down to refresh action. So drag, there it goes again. Polar bear hanging by his underwear. And just in that little example, right, you can see a lot of stuff designed just off of that single interface. So you swipe up to move down the list, tap on either side, swipe to load more, swipe down slightly. But like, it's all based off of this kind of hand and finger positioning. So all those gestures are driven off an understanding of 
kind of that primary input mode. Uh, another interesting thing about gestures, if you're inside of this gallery thing, right, you asked about pinch and zoom. So here, when you're inside of this thing, you can kind of pinch down to get out of modes. This is another area where I think those sort of gestures are useful. In fact, here, supporting lots of different fingers is actually great. So you can jump it down with two fingers or with five fingers. And uh, this is a nice idea from Josh Clark, this notion that screens sort of invite big gestures. At first, I had this isolated down to like big screens. So when you're in a gallery mode, you can just sort of like paw at it and it closes it. But now I actually think this is much more useful across all kinds of screens. Just a little bit more of a coarse gesture, if you will, that allows you to close things up or get out of modes. Um, and then I'll show you one more example of that, which I got right here. That's also kind of interesting. Again, forgive the scrolling because I've got to find where I hid this in here. But come on, come on, come on. Ah, here. Here's another example of this. Like when you're inside of a, a view, sort of like an almost modal for an image, just being able to hack at this to move it up or down and get it out of there is much more useful with sort of gesture-based shortcut than actually having to go up and hit that X or that little arrow, especially when you get into one-handed use. So another nice example of where if they pinch or if they swipe or they just like flick it up, just close it, right? Similar principle in terms of gestures are sloppy. Let people just sort of like on the screen as opposed to enforcing things like, you know, tap back to close, let them sort of swipe at it. Okay, cool. So that's some stuff about gestures. Other questions? Yeah, it looks like uh, oh, that's an easy pass. Thank you. Um, just going back to native versus um, mm -hmm. uh, mobile web, how do you think you strike the balance between sort of achieving consistency across those two different platforms whilst kind of giving your customers, users a reason to actually go and download an app. Yeah, so what do you do in terms of uh, consistency of experience and all these things? I mentioned um, how a lot of times the experiences between these things are sort of seamless, and I'll actually, I'm loading an example here because it turns out six decks was not enough to answer your question. I'll open a seventh. Uh, but here, let me show you this. I did some stuff for eBay not that long ago. And I went and tested a couple things. And what was really interesting was when you looked at the eBay apps, they had a, a solution on Android, they had a solution on the mobile web over here, and they had a solution in iOS, right? And they all were kind of the same but different. Some features were there, other features weren't there, and the experience you can totally tell three different teams built this, right? So is this all eBay or is this not eBay? And what I uh, worked on for them is a way to make this a lot more consistent, but still take into account the differences of the platform conventions. So you can see here the difference between the web browser and uh, iOS. And I'll get to that in a second about those differences. But why? Why does this matter? Well, let me show you an actual real flow. So. Uh, tested this out, right, and gave somebody the iOS app. And they go into the iOS app and they try to log in and God forbid they forgot their password. I know this never happens to you, right? You guys are much too smart to ever forget a password, but they forgot their password to get into eBay. So, okay, well, let's hit the forgot username and password button. And what does that do? Goes to a web browser where you enter their desktop site. So now you're inside of the desktop site, and then you go and you enter your eBay ID, and then you get this confirm your identity where you have to enter a postal code and zip code. And by the way, the phone number thing is totally not designed for mobile in a way, shape, or form, but whatever. You make your way through there, right? You hit done, and then it says, okay, now we've emailed you. So now you go from the iOS app to the web browser to email with an email that was designed in 1994, I know because I used to work at eBay. <laughs> so now you got this 
email inside of the web inside of your um, email client that tells you to go change your password. So you click change password, right? You come back to the desktop website. And by the way, in the desktop website, they have this really nice on hover over the mouse that actually shows up on top of the input field. So it is physically impossible to change your password on a mobile web browser. Well, anyhow, then you come back after this and now you get this. And now this is the mobile web experience. So you've gone from the iOS app to the desktop web experience to an email browser back to the desktop experience. And after you re-set up your password, you get dropped off on the mobile web experience. And what happened in the studies we did when people did this, they thought they were back in the app. They actually had no clue where they were at that point, but they just started browsing this thing and shopping here. Right? Because it kind of looked like eBay. They finally got in and they made their way through. So this is why I think some level of consistency and coherency between the platforms actually matters. Now you want to account for the variances between the platforms when you do that stuff. So for example here, um, you can tell a couple variances between the iOS native app and the mobile web experience. Note that they both have the simplified sort of sections in the menu, uh, which is home, ser uh, search, and your account. But inside of the mobile web browser, we put those controls at the top because you generally are going to have browser controls on the bottom and things like this. And you keep with the convention on the web of a logo takes you, you know, there's a logo up there that tells you where you're at. Whereas in a native app, you don't necessarily need that. And in iOS, at least, the convention is positioning the main navigation components in a bottom tab bar. But the internals of the product actually look pretty much the same, right? The rendering of the search results looks the same. It's the same critical information. It's generally the same interaction. So everything smushed in between the nav is um, similar. And then when you make your way over to Android, right, you use the Android action bar up here. You can use Android contextual actions. This was a little pre-material. So this is the hollow or whatever they call that previous one there. And actually, I have some gripes with the Android action bar because I think it just tries to do way too much stuff in a single place. Right? And then you've got your overflow menu up here, the kebab. Um, so I would say even in the case of Android, you might want to actually push this and do something more like that. Right? So here in iOS, you'll have those controls on the bottom, whereas here in Android, you can kind of replicate those controls on the top. Um, and the reason why I think this matters is when we looked at where were people unsatisfied across the eBay experience, one of the main reasons was there was gaps in functionality between the experiences. Missing features made people do horrible things like go to the desktop web experience on mobile, right? And people felt like the iPhone and Android apps were missing important things. So consistency of experience, in both in terms of feature set and in terms of um, content is good. Now, that said, generally all of our experiences are way too frickin' bloated across the board. So mobile is a nice forcing function to get you to simplify, and you can use it that way. The example that I showed here of Staples taking their checkout form for guests from 22 fields down to five fields, right? The five field design is a mobile design, but if you can get your checkout form down to five fields, why wouldn't you do that on every single screen? Right? This is one of the advantages of this mobile first design process. If you use these constraints of mobile, the smaller screen size, all these kinds of things, and you try to make a great conversion experience for the small size device, chances are you'll have good returns on all kinds of different devices as well. Okay. Behind you. Catch. All right, it actually works pretty well. Even if you get bopped in the head, it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, I'm interested in if you've had any experience of trying to bring about a cultural change um, in an environment where perhaps user experience and especially mobile user experience isn't valued for what it is. And it's just seen as ultimately designers doing a job and not really bringing about you know, a fundamental change to the manner in which people use a device and interact with, you know, your application or web? Yeah, so uh, the question was around, you know, how do you get people to care about this uh, within the organization? The way I have 
traditionally done this is by um, showing them the data, right? And like, I love this little progression. This is that PC chart that I showed you before. Oh, jump back. I spoiled my surprise. But so this is the growth of PCs over all these years. And uh, wow, it looks awesome up and to the right. Yay, go us. Right, and so I tend to sell people that don't look at things qualitatively. I try to sell them quantitatively. And what I do if the chart, chart is go, well, here's why we should really care about the mobile experience. <laughs> and when you look at it that way, then I think a lot of eyes open up. Um, there's also all sorts of other ways that you can pitch them on um, the data side of the coin. What was another one? Uh, here was another one that I used for a long time. Uh, right here. It's like, okay, yeah. You know, in 2010, PayPal had about 750 million in mobile payments. And since then, things have been a lot more interesting. So you can use data in those, all those kinds of different ways, right? Uh, another one that I just drafted not too long ago was for a long time, I was trying to make the case uh, internally at Yahoo around the impending importance of mobile. And I had, at the time, really been looking at what was going on in other markets like Japan, where mobile was a big deal. And so what you saw back in, sorry, I'm just going to build this out. What you saw back in 2006 on Mixi, which was the biggest social network in Japan, was that 14% of page views are, were on mobile. And then in 2011, it was 85%. And so you could kind of tell what was going to happen with something like Facebook. Right? This is another example of the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Um, so I've tried to sell things that way. But do I have a secret formula for enacting cultural change to make people care about design? No. It's been an uphill battle. And uh, it continues to be a process to get people to buy into it. It depends on the different culture that you're working in too. So now I work in uh, Google, and Google tends to be a very analytical culture, very engineering-centric culture. So what we instituted is a process uh, of right, rapid iterative testing, where every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we design and build a prototype. And every single Thursday, people outside the group, you know, general users, come in and use the product in its current state. And every single Friday, we share the results of that testing, and we repeat it week after week after week. And what that, that has done in that environment, which is a very data-driven environment, it's given people uh, something beyond opinion. So if we're in a meeting, someone says, I think it should be like this. Great, we'll just test it tomorrow, because there's already six people coming in. And it just squashes a lot of those decisions and puts uh, consumers or customers front and center that's part of the process. So there's processes you can employ as well. Show them data, uh, employ a process where all of a sudden insights are outvalued over opinions, and go from there. All right, uh, there's one behind you, and then we'll throw it over there. So directly behind you, he's got the Android, yeah. Hi there. Hi. Uh, what would be your suggested methods of increasing engagement, engagement on apps um, I've recently read an article because we work in the travel industry and the travel apps are one of the most un uninstalled apps. Hmm. So how do you keep the customer, potential customer, keep on coming back? Travel apps are the most uninstalled apps. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, how do you make them stay inside an app? Gamification. Just give them badges. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> remember that? Does anybody remember that gamification thing? Right? Yeah. That was a good time. Um, I think what, you know, it, it's different per app. But ultimately, what you want to do is give people value and make that value immediately apparent in your interface. What a lot of applications do, and I actually have some stuff in travel. Let me see if I can dig this up. So here's kind of one. Actually, I got a better image of this. Let me show you that. Here we go. So here's one way to book a, f a f uh, flight. And when you look at that, your first reaction is, oh my gosh, this is going to suck, right? 
And here's another way where it actually is the exact same process that collects pretty much all the same information, but up front that experience looks and feels very, very different. Um, and we can, if we had the time, I don't know if we're going to have the time, we can kind of walk through each of these questions. And the pro actually, you know what? I think I did this last year in this workshop, so I won't do it here. There's a video online. But we went through a process of looking at every single one of these questions and finding the right way to ask it. So one of the ways to help people continue to use a service is to reduce what I would call friction. Um, there's a nice little chart where I probably can't find it in my slide deck now, but you can either increase motivation or you can decrease uh, effort. In fact, BJ Fogg has a nice little model around this. Let me find it. Let me find this thing. He has this thing called um, the behavioral model. And what you're describing is you know, changing people's behaviors. So if you look at how he illustrates this, here's a nice little example of it. Uh, this one looks good. Let's view that image. So he basically says behavior equals motivation, ability, and triggers. And so motivation is how highly motivated are you to do this? Slowly motivated or highly motivated? If you're more motivated to do something, chances are your behavior will change. So in the travel industry, you know, motivations could be uh, getting tired of work, deals, those kinds of things. And then the other level here is ability. How hard is it to do? How easy is it to do? If it's super duper easy to do, you may not be very motivated to do it, but you'll do it anyway because it's super duper easy to do. And so it's not enough, though, to make something super easy to do or increase people's motivation. You actually have to trigger that behavior. And the triggers that he points out will work here. If they're on this side of the line, that is, if you've made it easy enough or motivation's high enough, when you ping people with a notification or whatever, it will work here. They will not work here. So what I was showing there is really moving this lever, right? Like taking it from hard to do all the way down to easy to do. And increasing motivation falls more on the marketing um, desirability side of the coin as opposed to the interaction side of the coin. But I've been uh, showing this example for quite a while, which is here's setting, uh, getting a ride on Uber. Right? This is kind of how they traditionally did it. You've got to sign up to get a ride. So you have to fill an account, email address, password, profile, mobile number, payment info, terms and info, submit. And now <laughs> they have this implementation where all you have to do is put your finger on the Touch ID sensor. You don't go through any sign-up form or any checkout form. It just uses Apple Pay, and you're done. So talk about that moving that ability all the way down to easy to do. right? Instead of that kind of experience, you just put your thumb on that dot, and you have signed up, and you have entered your credit card information, and you have paid. So conversion is a tap as opposed to that whole thing. So this is the kind of stuff that I think you can do in travel. In terms of finding the motivators to getting people in there, it's another area of exploration. And the triggers, too, you can do a lot of experimentation with notifications, um, with the kinds of marketing you do and all that stuff to get people in there. But just know those triggers will not work unless you're on the right side of that line. OK. Uh, yeah, I got one over here. It's going to be a big throw. Think you'll make it? Here we go. Oh. Beautiful. Wow. <coughs> Impressive. OK. Um, when, when should businesses think wearable first? Oh, wow. When should businesses think wearable first? Uh, oh, man. The, you know, you get so many of these firsts nowadays. <laughs> API first, watch first, TV first, everybody is thinking first. I don't think it's a viable thing yet. I have seen a lot of interesting instances where just like the, uh, actually here, I got a little article thing on here. Let me help you with this. Uh, where did I put that? Ah, here we go. So if you want to dig into this, I wrote this little thing about wearables and the like, and you'll see some of uh, the topics that we talked about today, like always on, always visible, some of the stuff from uh, the Google wearables guys, some examples and the like. But uh, the interesting thing to me about this sort of interface versus the uh, smartphone interface, it's a further simplification of stuff in that you need to make things very glanceable, 
And so there's a high bar for relevance to make things glanceable because it's a time and place kind of constraint. And then the other piece is you don't have time, time, haha, <laughs> yuck, yuck, get it? You can't just take an app and put it on here. You have to think more in terms of actions, not apps. So I don't think the market for this stuff is big enough yet to make it a priority in terms of business impact. But I do believe going through the exercise of thinking about how your service can show up on here has an opportunity to help you um, focus and learn more about what you are doing anyway, as all of these kinds of things do. So uh, there was a interesting, R wait, okay, hold on, I'll find it. There was an interesting article that I was just reading on this topic, which is, oh, where did I throw it? Yeah, so City Mapper wrote a bunch of stuff about their applications on the uh, Apple Watch. And one of the key points that they made on here was they're actually learning a bunch of stuff from creating the Apple Watch interface that they're now bringing back up to their mobile UI, right? So forcing themselves to think through the, like, what are the actions, what's sort of the glanceable atomic unit of our app has given them a pile of ideas to bubble out to other applications. So I think that's the state it's at. It's too early to go bet your entire farm on this, but useful stuff to learn for sure. Okay, uh, last question. Can we throw the Android back over Jan? Because I think we're off to dinner in like five minutes. Is that right? At lunch? Where is it? Where am I? It's 4.47 a.m. for me, I'm sorry. <laughs> am I even coherent up here? People are passing a fuzzy robot around. I don't know if this is a dream or not. Hi, yeah. Um, we currently have a, a separate mobile website. Should we be moving towards a responsive? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <We're> <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy one. I guess I'll give you guys one more. And I'll, I will elaborate a little bit on that. I think the reason why you want to do that is even if you have a separate mobile website, there's enough diversity in what is mobile right now, as I showed you with all those different screen sizes, that you need some level of flexibility and adaptability just to deal with the mobile size range. The other big important reason on that is like, how do you even detect what's mobile? Where do you cut it off? Do you arbitrarily say at five and a half inches, you get the mobile site, at six inches, you get this? And if you do that, how are you actually even querying for the physical size of the device? You can't. CSS doesn't tell you that. You have to have some sort of data de uh, device database that you query and say, is this mobile or not? And at uh, that point, some human is arbitrarily making that decision and on and on and on. The complications go forward. So what I would do these days is I would decide whether or not you want a native app. And native apps are useful for all kinds of different things. But they are also a big investment, not just up front, but later on down the line. You've also got to think about what platforms you want it on. But regardless of whether or not you have a native app, I think you definitely want a responsive experience just to deal with all these different devices and to deal with all the in-between moments, right? So that one is sort of a given, but uh, the other stuff could, you could be viewed almost as an enhancement to that web experience. Okay. I said you could do one more. Anybody got one more? Or should I just show you some? Oh, one up there. All right. Big throw for the Android. This is the furthest that's gone today. So, dun, 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 dun. Oh! <laughs> nice. That was good. OK. Um, I was just wondering if you have any opinion on what we should be doing with personalization and where that fits in. How we should deal with personalization and how that fits in. Uh, you know what? That's one thing I don't actually have a slide for, but I can tell you that one of the biggest regrets we had at Yahoo was putting a sign out link inside of the header. And the reason for that was that everybody would uh, go check their email, sign out, and then we'd know nothing about them. When they were signed in, we could show them content that was relevant for them. We could do all sorts of things. And it was like a 10x increase in value for us. Uh, that lesson has stayed with me so much so that with the last two products I've built, we've buried the sign up button under like edit account. So we just keep you signed in as long as humanly possible so that we can give you the most relevant stuff humanly possible. Uh, that may seem like a bad thing to bury the sign out link, but honestly, in many cases, it's a good thing 
because people forget their logins, they have problems with signing in, and if you can keep them in, you can give them a much more relevant experience, which is a good thing. Okay, so uh, in the last five minutes, I'll just show you guys two cool things, and then I will let you go. Actually, anybody have a super burning question? Something you're dying to ask that we didn't cover? You flew all this way, you drove all this way, you trained all this way, anything? Yes, okay, there is one. Let's toss her the Android. Because the thing I'm gonna show you is just kind of funny, so I don't wanna end it on just that. Hello? Yeah. Um, yeah, my question is, is Google building a, it's a slightly different question, but is Google building a separate index for mobile? Um, true or false, and if so, yeah, what are the benefits and impact for desktop and mobile? Uh, we are believers in delivering the right experience for the right device. <laughs> uh, that is all I can say on that. And you can see in the changes that they made recently. Like, I mean, if you follow all the search optimization changes, they're like, if a site's faster, give it more prominence. If a site's more relevant, give it more prominence. If a site is optimized for devices, especially mobile these days, give it more prominence. So they're all oriented to giving people better results. So you can expect that kind of thing. Um, there is a thing inside of Insights that shows you how good you rank in terms of mobile optimization inside of the uh, Page Insights and Speed Insights kind of thing, and that will give you a sense of how good you're stacking up and the like. But responsive is a great way of getting there, especially for all these different devices that are out. Okay, so just before we go to lunch, I want to leave you guys with one thing, which is about the dangers of uh, flat design. So don't let this happen to you. And thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>